Lord, as I <clears throat> try to unline, present this message tonight, Lord, that we can see clearly what we need to see. And we want to thank you now that our minds are off of everything else and alert and alive, and we're going to pay attention to what the minister has to say. And we just thank you, Lord. Let the spirit of wisdom and revelation rest upon each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to talk about two things tonight. One, I want to talk about the catching up of the saints, which we call the rapture. And what is the purpose of it? Underline that. What is the purpose of the rapture? And two, what is the purpose of the tribulation? Okay, you got that? Very important that we understand. What is the purpose of the rapture? What is the purpose of the tribulation years? And how does it affect us as God's children? First, I'm going to read uh, John 14. St. John 14, starting with verse 1. Be up on the board. Jesus is talking. Amplified, please. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Be concerned, but don't worry. Right, Willie? <laughs> See, I heard your message. Don't, do not let your heart be troubled, distressed, agitated. You believe and a heap to and trust in and rely on God. They believe and heave to and trust in and rely also on me. And I might say, not adding anything to the Word of God because it's in the Word of God. And also rely on what I say. All right, go to the next verse. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I am going away. Why are you going away, Jesus? To prepare a place for you. All right. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Next. <clears throat> and, when I, and when, if I go and make ready for a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And the next verse. And to the place where, where I am going, you know the way. And of course, we know if we went on with that chapter, uh, he's dealing with Philip, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and, and on and on and on. But what I want you to see there, one of the purposes for the rapture is for God to keep his word. He said, I'm going, and I'm coming back, that where I may be, you may be also. So one of the reasons for the rapture According to the Bible, he's talking to Christian people. He's not talking to the sinners. He's not talking about those that work iniquity. He is talking about those that are saved, put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us, and he's going to come back. Why are you coming back? To receive my church to myself, that where I am, you shall be also. That's clear. It, I don't see why anybody would reject that. Now, let's turn to, put Romans 5, 9 up there. Romans 5, 9. And let's go through the scriptures and accentuate that a little bit better. Romans 5, 9. Are we ready? There we go. Therefore, since we are now justified. Everybody say, I'm justified. Yes. Acquitted. Yes. Made righteous. Yes. And brought into yes. right relationship with God by Christ's blood all right now notice this how much more certain is it that we shall be saved by him that is Christ from the indignation and wrath of God everybody got that I mean I think that's clear we can't say it no clearer we're saved from the wrath of God. Now, turn to Ju Judge Jude one fourteen. Jude one fourteen. One chapter in Jude, so the fourteenth verse. 
Look what the Holy Spirit is saying to this man. It was of these people, moreover, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with his might raid of holy ones or, or, or saints, 10,000 of his saints or angels. Now he's coming back. That's, well, we know that that's the tribulation years. That's the second coming. He's coming back. He's coming back with the saints. Remember the rapture, he comes for the saints. Everybody got it? He's coming for the saints in the rapture. We go up there. Seven years later, we come back with the Lord at the second coming. But why is he coming back? Let's see what the word of the Lord says. Next verse. To execute. Hmm, there's the purpose. To execute judgment upon the saints. <coughs> huh? Misquoted that. Upon all and to convict all the impious unholy ones of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the severe, abusive, jarring things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against Jesus. So, the purpose of the rapture is to take us home. The purpose of the tribulation year is to bring judgment upon the ungodly. Grunt or something. <laughs> Just grunt. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> is that clear? <laughs> All right. I mean, don't you feel like... <laughs> I know you've had a busy day. understand that. All right. So, we got that clear. Stamp it down. Why is he coming Now, another reason why he's coming back, the second coming, notice this, to fulfill the 70th year of Daniel 9. Remember, there was to be 70 years punishment towards the Jews for rejecting Christ as their Savior, their disobedience. You remember that? They got seven more years. <coughs> 69 years of punishment has already been carried out. And then that brought us right up to the cross. Right up to the day of the cross. It's all in the Bible outlined, prophesied. Right to the day, but they rejected their Savior. So God turned from the Jews. That is, as far as them carrying out the gospel. And you find it in Acts 28 when Paul says that. Turn to the Gentiles, and for the last 2,000 years, the Gentiles have been preaching the gospel to the nations, which was, by the way, the Jewish job. I can't go into everything, but you get the picture. So, number two, the second reason is to fulfill the 70th year. God has to keep his promises. If he doesn't keep his promises... We can't bank our faith on God. But he keeps his promises. The Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. Right to the T. All right? Now, let's look at another scripture. I want you to look at... Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Isaiah 26, 21. Isaiah 26, 21. Old Testament. We've got some real good scriptures here tonight. All right. Isaiah is speaking. He's saying, Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place in heaven. Why, Lord? To punish the saints. Huh? To punish who? The inhabitants of the earth. For what? For their iniquity. The earth also will disclose the blood shed upon her and will no longer cover her slain and conceal her guilt.
earth will display all what these old, all these wicked people have done to them. It will be shown how, I don't know, but they'll display how these wicked people have slain them and their blood and all will be <coughs> revealed. Now, look at that. Dealing with the ungodly for their iniquity. Now, everybody, we know this. God takes, uh, Ezekiel tells us this. God takes no pleasure in punishing the wicked. He offers everybody salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If thy will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thy shall be saved. So it's no need for anybody to have to suffer the punishment of a holy God because God has offered them life. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Why don't you believe that and escape the wrath of God that's coming to deal with the ungodly for those that will not humble themselves, repent, and receive Jesus Christ and be born again by the Spirit of God and walk in the Spirit. He gives everybody that opportunity, and we as a church is engaged in getting that message out to the world. So, when you understand that God has given man a will, you have to choose. Aren't you glad you've chosen Christ? Aren't you glad you know what your future is? <coughs> God takes no pleasure <coughs> in destroying the wicked. But you see, there's a certain amount of time that God has set. You must understand this. And the time of the Gentiles is running out. And that means God has planned a certain seven. 6,000 years, 7,000 counting the millennium years that he's given people to repent and get right. And now we're just about at the end of that 6,000 years and billions of people are going after everything that is corrupt, false gods and everything else. But you understand, world, we're running out of time and therefore God's got to come back and punish the wicked. Can everybody see that picture? He cannot let it continue on. Because, listen, if he don't shorten those days, nobody will be saved. The wickedness is increasing in this world. Do we understand that? You must understand the increase of wickedness and unlawlessness in the last days. And so the time is running out. And God's got to take action now. And do what he says he's, he's got to do. Okay? He's given man thousands of years of grace and mercy. But some folks just ain't going to take it. But God says it's there for us. Now, let's read this. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, heaven, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. You know why the Lord is not going to punish us for our iniquities that we've done? He punished Jesus. Christ took our punishment upon him. Hello? And he gave us his righteousness. Isn't that awesome? Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, I don't care. You can shout. Don't shout too loud, Doc. I'm a hearing aid in. Christ took our punishment and now these that have refused Jesus Christ which is their only means for salvation to become righteous in the sight of God many of them are going out trying to establish their own righteousness by good works and good deeds and through religious rituals and all of those things which are nothing it's Christ alone 
and what he did on that cross that we put our faith and trust in. And therefore, he took our punishment upon himself and gave us his righteousness. What a Savior we have. All right, let's read a little bit the next verse now. In that day, the Lord will deliver Israel from her enemies. Now, for those that have read the Bible, you understand Armageddon. That's the last war. You know what the first war was? The first war in the Bible was when Abraham and his servants went and delivered Lot. How many remember that in the Bible? Okay. That was the first war. The last war will be Armageddon War. Notice what it says. We'll deliver Israel. Now we're talking about the nation of Israel. If you've read in, in Zechariah and, and uh, also in um, Revelation, we see that Christ comes and is going to save the Jews. He's going to land on Mount Olive. And there's going to be a remnant of Jews in Bethlehem, not Bethlehem, but in Jerusalem, that will be saved to be able to go over into the millennium years to reproduce, and Israel will become the nation, the capital nation of the world. Now look what it says. And also from the, from the rebel powers of evil, all right, let's read that again. <clears throat> In that day, the Lord will deliver Israel from her enemies and also from the rebel powers of evil and darkness. His sh so Christ will deliver the Jews from all of that. His sharp and unrelenting, great and strong sword will visit and punish. Now they got Le Leviathan there. If you know anything about Leviathan, it's in the Bible. It's this big, uh, some people say it's like a big alligator, a cracker doll, big monster thing. Anyway, we'll go into that. You find out also in Lot. <laughs> and, the, and the swiftly fleeing servant, well, we know who that dude is, <coughs> Satan, <coughs> Leviathan, the twisting and winding serpent, and he will slay the monster that is in the sea. Well, he's coming, and he's going to deliver Israel from her enemies. Put it that way. All right, you got that. So that happens at Armageddon. And, all right, let's look at the next verse. Next verse. In that day, it will be said of the redeemed nation of Israel, a vineyard beloved and lovely, sing a responsive song to it and about it. Oh, we're, no, that's, we're, in, we're in Isaiah 26. You got Isaiah 27 too there. That sounds pretty good, don't it? <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> in that day, I will, it will be said of the redeemed nation of Israel. That's Isaiah 27. Uh, Willie, Isaiah 26 is what we want. Chapter 26. There we go. So trust in the Lord. Commit yourself to him. Lean on him. Hope confidently in him forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock, the rock of ages. Let me find that in the Bible. Isaiah, where you at, partner? There we go, 26. All right. Isaiah 26, 19. 26, 19. Your dead shall live, O Lord. Your bodies, the bodies of our dead saints shall rise. That sounds like the resurrection, doesn't it? That sounds like the rapture. Hey. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew, O Lord, is a dew of sparkling light, heavenly supernatural dew. And the earth shall cast forth the dead, that's the resurrection, to life again. 
For on the land of the shades of the dead you will let your dew fall, which will resurrect the saints. Now listen to this. Come, my people. All right. Isaiah is saying through the inspiration of God, Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your door behind you. Why, Lord? Hide yourself for a little while. Why? Why? Until the Lord's wrath is past. Wow. That sounds like we go up and the wrath of God comes down to the tribulation years. And when all that's over, then we come back. Look what it says again. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. Heaven, notice this, that next, that's verse 20, 21. Look at that. Why is he coming out? Why is he coming there? To punish the inhabitants of the earth for what? For their iniquity. For them not accepting his grace. What can he do? They won't repent. They have a will. He can't trespass their will. Boy, if we can, we'd go out there and drag them in here, water baptize them. But that won't save them. They've got to make their own mind up who they're going to serve. God has given a man a will. And with that will, he is supposed to govern himself under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I want to say that again. God has given us a will to govern our own selves by the leadership of His Holy Spirit. Now listen to me and listen to me carefully. Everybody that you see that's in some type of trouble, not putting them down, I'm just telling the truth, what I've seen. They're not governing themselves. They're not ruling and reigning in Christ. They're not being led by the Spirit. Those that are led by the Spirit are sons of God. And when people don't make that decision to learn to rule and reign by the act of their will, trusting the Holy Spirit, ruling over this earth right here, this body, when they don't do that, the devil comes in there and they're in a lot of trouble. So the biggest job we have to wake them up and tell them what they need to do because you can't passively just float along and expect victory in your life. Maintaining your life is very important. Stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Now if you're caught in that bondage, we love you. We're going to help you get back on the road. But once we get you back on the road and we tell you what you need to do to stay alive... You've got to do it if you're going to stay alive in God. Am I mean? Maybe I shouldn't tell it like it is. Yeah. See, only the truth will set us free. I tell you what, you don't eat for three weeks. <laughs> don't sleep for three weeks. Why am I this way? Oh, <laughs> it's so simple. It's not complicated. But we make it that way because we're not willing to follow the rules that's laid out in the Word of God. And so now we're in trouble. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's finish this. The earth also will disclose. We've, we've read that. Okay. So we see here that there's going to be a resurrection. And those that are resurrection are God's people. They're going to be kept in a safe place, shut the door for a little while until God pours out His wrath upon those that refuse to repent and He has to deal with them because He has to honor His Word. He said He would do it and He does what He says. I've seen parents say, if you do that again, I'm going to spank you. They never spank you know, the kid and their kid knows it. Oh, you said that 20 years ago. Ha, 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 ha. When you say something, nail it down. A yes is a yes, and no is a no. Come on, church, shout at me or do something. That's right. Don't throw no rocks, please. Oh. <laughs> Woo. All right. Let's move on here. I want you to turn now to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Woo, this is getting good. Get happy here. 
For God has not appointed us. Who's us? Who's us? Us Christians to occur His wrath. To occur His wrath. So His wrath is coming. Who is it coming to? Those that will not repent and continue to sin and will not accept the offer of grace and mercy and not accept what Christ did that they might escape the wrath of God. Notice this. Now that very plainly clears that one of the reasons for the rapture is to God to get us out of here for something. Look, for God has not appointed us to occur His wrath. He did not select us to condemn us but that we might attain His salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn to the next verse. Who died for us so that whether we are still alive or dead at Christ's appearing, we might live together with Him and share His life. I want to turn to now uh, 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2. Y'all might want to shout on this. I don't know. I've been shouting all day. My voice is getting hoarse. Hoarse, hoarse. I cancel that out in Jesus' name. <laughs> thank you. I heard somebody clear the throat out there. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> all right, are you ready? Look. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now Paul is talking to the Christian people, the church at Thessalonians, but relative to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the rapture, he's talking to the church, look what it says, the Messiah, and are gathering together to meet him. We beg you, brother. Now notice, catch this. Our, no, hold, just stay right there, uh, Willie, where you were at, where you were at. I want to milk that a little bit are gathering together to meet him. Now, when you go back and you read Thessalonians, you find that the dead in Christ, that means my daddy, my mama, my sister, my brother-in-laws, all the saints that I've known over the years, relatives and all, that their bodies are in the ground, and when Christ comes back, he brings their spirit, and their bodies are caught up, and at that moment, when they caught up to meet the Lord, it's so fast, we are changed in the twin of an eye, and we're gathered together with our loved ones. Catch it now. We're gathered together with the whole church, those that have been in the grave, their bodies, us that we are alive. We meet the Lord, and we have a fellowship right there. And there's Dad. There's Mom. There's your wife. There's your husband. There's your son. Look, we're all meeting together in the air. Somebody shout. I don't care, shout. I dare you to shout. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. Where's the who? Does my wife have to be there? If anybody's sleeping, wake them up. If that don't get you woke up, I don't know what I can do. <coughs> See, we only have a certain time together. And if we don't use that little bit of time to hear what God is saying through the teachers, we're in bad shape. All those hours we have out there in the world, it's just a little bit of time at church together. And somebody's mind is on apple pie or ice cream or How many love me? Just very, it, it's just about, it's just, a, yeah, I'm stressing it, ain't I? All right. Come on, you know I'm telling the truth. We got we to gotta be strong, courageous, be brave. We got to charge. Got to wake up. The Bible tells us. I remember that, that message that uh, Rose, Rose preached. Or listen to that again. Wake up. <laughs> she, she had that scripture in there. Boy, I woke up. What would you say, Ruth? <laughs> All right, now look. Go to the next verse. Now we're going to meet. Remember, the meeting of the air is going to be our loved ones. All of them have been confused. 
And Paul was trying to straighten them out. And then he says, not to allow your minds to be quickly unsettled or disturbed or kept excited or alarmed, whether it be by some pretended revelation of the Spirit or by the word or by letter alleged to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already arrived and is here. Okay? Now, there they were, rewind the tape 2,000 years back. If Paul was talking about the second coming, the Lord would have been on earth. Those Christian people would have experienced all that great tribulation that's going to go on for those seven years. It's not about that, but they thought they missed the rapture. All right. That's why Paul is writing the letter to the Thessalonians, which helps us. Okay. Now go to the next verse. <laughs> so it didn't arrive there yet. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the hypocrisy come first. What is that? That means those that claim to be Christians, they fall back into the world. You'll see a lot of that today. I love people, but you know. They say one thing and they do this. Okay? So we pray for them. Unless the predicted great falling away. Now it's been predicted that there will be. And Paul predicts that in Timothy. Notice this. Who have professed to be Christians has come. All right? And the man of lawlessness, sin, is revealed who is the son of doom of perdition. All right. Now, Paul is saying that day will not come until two things. OK, one is the hypocrisy. People falling away from the faith. You have to be in the faith to fall out from it. Had to be in the boat to get out of the boat. What about one saved and all saved? I'm for it. <laughs> what I try to do is keep people safe. I'm for it. <laughs> but I know the word of God, so we won't go into that right now. All right. Next verse. Who opposes and exalts himself, talking about the Antichrist, so proudly and, and uh, uh, insultantly against and over all that is called God or that is worship, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. So we know that if he's going to take his seat in the temple, the temple has to be rebuilt. Okay, we understand that. Now, he's going to help the Jews to rebuild it. And they think that he's doing that for them. But he's not doing that for them. He's doing that for himself. And he doesn't know it, but he's going to fulfill the scriptures because he's going to go in there and sit down and claim to be God. And that's when all... Well, you, you put it in there, breaks out, okay? I don't have time to go into all of that. I have gone in the past, but it, I only have a little bit of time. Okay, here we go. All right, next verse. Now, let's move on real quick. Do not, rec don't you, do, don't you rec recollect that when I was still with you, I told you about these things, and they said, uh, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> next verse. <clears throat> and now you know what is restraining him. Now, who, who's him? Antichrist, Antichrist, that's him. Something is restraining him from being revealed at this time. It is so that he may be manifested, notice this, revealed in his own appointed time. There was an appointed time for Christ to come. There's an appointed time for the Antichrist to be revealed. But something's restraining him. Now, I've studied this for years. I've read commentaries. I've beat myself up. Done everything I know to do. Cut myself. <laughs> beat myself. <laughs> Let me, sp don't do that. You got to get the revelation from God. But this is what I see, and you may disagree. That's all right. Just love me, and I'll love you. But we know that the Holy Spirit is a restraining power. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, the earth would be just totally destroyed. But, God has another, he has his body on the earth who has the Holy Spirit who he uses to restrain the powers of darkness. 
for the, for, the, for the prayers of a righteous man avail as much. So every time we pray, we're coming up against the powers of darkness. And we're restraining him. I'll guarantee you, when we get to heaven and, and, and God would show us all these people praying for you, and, and uh, he would say, now, if they didn't pray for you, you would have been absorbed. You would have been destroyed. You would have been totally, absolutely destroyed by Satan. But the saints of God prayed for you, restraining the enemy from taking your life out before time. So that's why we pray one for another. That's why Paul says, pray for me. Why should we pray for you, Paul? You're an apostle. No, I'm a, I'm a man too. I need prayer. So prayer is very important. <clears throat> and so what I see is, no, what is restraining him? What is restraining him? I say that it's the Holy Spirit's power and also the Holy Spirit's power working through the body of Christ. And Christ is the head of that body. And we restrain the enemy. Now, I also know that government restrains. Government, if you read Romans 13, is ordained of God. That's why we're to, we are to pray for our president. We're to pray for those in authority because they restrain evil to so much. But then there's another power on the earth, which is the power of the church that restrains evil. Believe me. And so when the church is taken up, the Holy Spirit will go with the church, but the Holy Spirit will be here, but not like in the church, okay? When you, you have to really know the, the reason and the purpose for the church. When you, Paul is the only one that gave us the mystery of, of the church and how it's to function and operate, okay? But I can't go into that right now, but most of you know that, that every one of us are important, and that's why the enemy comes at us all the time trying to stop us from restraining him from coming against our families and our children and our loved ones and people that we pray for. Okay, so he's going to be revealed at his time. So two things have to happen. The falling away and he that restraineth, which we're saying the church and the Holy Spirit together, is taken out of the way and then the Antichrist will be revealed and he can start his thing on the earth. Everybody see that? All right. Go to the next verse. For the mystery of lawlessness that is hidden principle, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority. Now, if you've been around long enough, if you've got kids, you know there's a certain amount of rebellion in every child. I mean, not us, but I mean them. <coughs> but you see it in your own life, too. Okay? Have you recognized it yet? <laughs> Have you repented of it yet? <laughs> when you see it, don't get condemned. Just say, God, thank you for showing my, me my rebellion. And repent and ask God for the grace to overcome that tendency to rebel against authority. Be nice, Bob. Think it will. All right, look what it says. Mm. Go to the next verse. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. So when will the Antichrist be revealed? The fall in the way of the saints, and he that restraineth the Holy Spirit in the church is taken out of the way, and then what? The Antichrist will be what? Revealed. All right? But we won't be here because we've been taken out of the way by the rapture. That's another purpose of the rapture. Hello? Are you out there? Another purpose is to remove us. Now, <coughs> I used to think, and I, and, I, and I do believe this, that our prayers and us being here, standing against evil and all, is restraining upon those that practice iniquity and refuse his grace and mercy and his salvation. So he removes us 
And now he can pour out his wrath upon those that are set to do their thing and rebel against God and line up with the Antichrist. How many see that? You must see that. I'll give you a simple example. Let's just say that uh, Rose and uh, Missy and Susan's over there at my house. Okay, we're all out here. We got a big gun. And there's, there's a, somebody there that wants to kill them. And somebody said, well, just blow the house up and you'll get, you will get the man. But we can't. I can't. Why, why can't you? Well, I'll kill, we'll kill Rose and Missy and Susan. Oh, that's right, too. So they're restraining us from blowing the house up to get the criminal. How many see it? All right. But then we see something. There's Missy. She's on the run. She's ahead of them all. And there's Rose right behind her. And here comes Susan. Flash Gordon. And they get away from it. And we got our gun set. There ain't nothing restraining us now. Fire one. Boom. How many see the picture? All right. That's simple. It's not complicated. Get us out of the way. We're restraining God. And you go back into the Bible, and if I had time, and five more minutes, but I'll, I'll roughly go through it. Abraham and the Lord. Remember the three, the three people, three angels, one was the Lord. Back in the Old Testament, Jesus re revealed himself as an angel. Oh, you know that now. But not so in the New Testament. Okay, now listen. They're coming up. Abraham's sitting at his tent under the oak tree, cooling it. He sees the three men coming up, and he recognizes one is the Lord. To make a long story short, he kills a big um, heifer and, and cuts some steaks and cooks some steaks for, for them and all that. And they have dinner together. And then they get up, they start walking towards Solomon and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, <coughs> Lord, well, basically, what, what are you going to do? And, and God said something. He said, would I do anything on the earth without first telling my friend Abraham? Would I do anything on the earth without telling my church, my friend, my body? <laughs> All right, you know, put it on your shelf. Answer to that is no, because Abraham began to bargain with the Lord. Well, Lord, if you find 50, 40, you know, right on down to 10, right, uh, righteous people... Would you spare the city? Yes, I would. Hmm. But here's, here's where it all comes to. The angels went in there. They could only find, basically, three people came out. Lot and his two daughters. One, two, three. Got the righteous out. And the angels were trying to hurry up, hurry up. Had to get them out. And then what happened? Somebody tell me. Boom! The righteous was restraining God from destroying those five cities, actually. But when the righteous was removed in the rapture, boom! It happened. Simple, not complicated. All right. And then the lawless one, the, the Antichrist, will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by his appearing at his coming. Now, this is very important, and I've been teaching this. When you see a verse of Scripture, there can be two events, two events in that one verse of Scripture. All right? And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. So we know he's revealed. But where's the church at that point? Where's the church? Out of the way. They're in heaven. All right, notice this now. Now, he'll be revealed, but how many of you know he's got to do his thing for seven years? Can you see the picture? He's got to do his thing for seven years. Am I coming through? Then... The Lord will slay him when, when the Lord appears at the second coming. How many sees it? Very important you see that. Uh, and many scriptures in the Bible are just like that. I could spend all night talking about those scriptures like that. 
Okay? We're almost through, and Rose has got to go pick her little grandson up. All right, let me get to some other good scriptures. Turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and we'll quit on this one. i got so much, I'm going to preach on this Sunday. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians 1.10, this is a powerful, powerful, powerful scripture. Now notice, catch it, read it. And, and I can't see, yeah, one ten. And how you look forward to, notice this, forward to, for, forward to what? Await the coming of his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who personally, notice this, who personally rescued and delivered us out of and from the wrath bringing punishment which is coming upon the impentance and draw us to himself, investing us with all the privileges and rewards of the new life in Christ the Messiah. Now let's digest that. Let's digest that. Powerful. Just look at that and read that. All right, we're looking forward to what? The coming of the Lord. That's the rapture. And that's Jesus, whom he raised from the dead. Okay. And Jesus personally rescued us, now notice this, and delivered us out of the wrath, or from the wrath, to come, bringing punishment, which is coming upon who? The dependents, those that refuse to repent. That wrath, that punishment is not coming on the church, it's coming on those that refuse to repent, And refused his wooing, drawing us to himself, and investing us with all the privileges. So we see the privileges and rewards of the new life in Christ Jesus when we're in heaven. Now, you got to see that. He delivers us out of and from the wrath. Put the King James and we'll close it up. King James up there. Same verse. And to wait for his son from heaven. All right, we're all waiting. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, what wrath is to come? Well, when you go all through the Bible, you will see it's the wrath to punish those that refuse to repent and give their life to Christ. And they just want to continue on and just make the world that much more evil. And that's why he had to destroy the first part of, the, uh, of those on the earth during the Noah's flood. Because it became so corrupt. The only way that you can get deliverance is you got to deal with that leaven. A little leaven will leaven the whole loaf. You got to remember that. And, and just drive that in your brain. Because you may be putting up with a little leaven. And I tell you what, saints, I know it from experience. You've got to deal with it and get it out of your life. Or it will consume. A little leaven leavens the whole what? The whole loaf. Boy. Okay. And we've all struggled in that area with the little leaven. Well, just a little bit of leaven. Yeah, but it will filter into the whole loaf. So that's why we got to be 100% committed. And we're not talking about you're going to be perfect for every such way. I'm going to share this and we'll close. I am what I am by the grace of God. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace will help us to overcome whatever leaven is there. But God's grace will, will sustain us during that time of us working with God and allowing God to work it out. Follow me? Work it out until it's gone. How many of you understand what I just said? That's very important. His grace will be sufficient to hold you steady. And as you let him work in you, for it's God working in us, making us willing to do his good pleasure, your faith must get into him to work it out. Because you're not going to do it in your own effort, in your own power. 
and your own whatever. You've got to trust God to work all that living out and realize, remember this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. God is in the process of sanctifying us, spirit, soul, and body. He is, and He's faithful to do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank You now that we see a little bit more clear tonight. <clears throat> and I pray, Lord, as Sunday comes, we'll have more time to expound on some many scriptures that we have. And we want to thank you now for what we've learned tonight. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.